The Lord be with you. This is the day the Lord has made. Good morning. It is my delight to welcome you all to worship here at Beulah Presbyterian Church this morning. On our fourth Sunday in Lent, there are lots of announcements, so I hope you will look through the bulletin for those. Um, we'd like to welcome and thank Terry Hargrave for being here this morning to give us a message from the pulpit. Um, we'd like to welcome members and visitors here this morning, whether physically in this place or virtually on Facebook or YouTube. We hope that joining us for worship today will nurture your heart and transform your mind. If you're new to Beulah, we hope you'll join us again and consider attending one of our mission, fellowship, or education opportunities. And to that end, please sign the who's who in the pew pad and leave your contact information so we may reach out to you. If you're interested in becoming a member of Beulah, please speak with the pastor or one of the greeters at the door. The church's contact info is also found in the bulletin announcements. Council and commissions meet today following worship. The congregational meeting is Sunday, March 17th, immediately following worship. Annual reports are available in the lobby. Easter flowers are for order, and please refer to the announcements for any further information on that. And now I would like to invite Sue Kyle to come forward for a minute for mission. Morning, friends. It's me again. I was here last week, too. But I forgot to tell you a few things, so I'm up here again. I'm going to talk about um, one great hour of sharing just for a minute. That's what these blue brochures are about. Don't look at it like the LG&E slip that I always throw away. Please look at it. <laughs> and it corresponds with this fish box. And on the table in the narthex are many more fish boxes that you can put together and you can put coins in it to be collected on Chris oh, Christmas, Easter morning. This is for one great hour of sharing. Now you can fill it up with coins or you could squeeze paper money in there. You could squeeze checks in there. It all works. But what I forgot to tell you was how the money's divided up. 36% of everything collected goes for action to alleviate hunger and systemic causes of poverty so that everyone can eat. 32% goes for disaster assistance. Working alongside communities in recovery after devastation of natural or human-caused disasters. And 32% goes to partnering in progress and self-development of people, educating and teaching them skills. So, as you notice, on the brochure, it says at least twice, if, we, if everybody does a little, it adds up to a lot. And although we are not necessarily seeing the, the immediate effects, this is so important. It's collected once a year during Lent, and it's a worldwide gift. So please consider. The second thing I want to tell you is that in the bulletin, it has book club on Wednesday. Usually we meet on the second Wednesday of the month. But this time we're gonna meet on Thursday after Ladies Circle. So the circle's at 11.30 on Thursday and book club will be at 1.30 in the library. We're gonna discuss the Book of Longings and all the light we cannot see. Everybody's welcome. Even if you haven't read the book, come anyway. We'll have a good time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sue. I now invite everyone in body or in spirit to stand for the call to worship. Oh, give thanks to the Lord for God is good, for God's steadfast love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. 
those God redeemed from trouble and gathered in from the lands, from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. Let them thank the Lord for God's steadfast love, for God's wonderful works to humankind. And let them offer thanksgiving sacrifice and tell of the Lord's deeds with songs of joy. The faithfulness of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. The mercies of God are new every morning. Beloved, confession of our sin before God is an act of trust in the goodness of God. In confession, we draw near to our maker in candor, knowing that nothing can be hidden from God. As we are honest with God and with one another about those places in our lives that stand in need of God's healing, we are open to the mercies of God. So let us confess our sin, first in unison and then in silence. Holy God, giver of all that is good, we rejoice that you are the source of all that is. The breath of life is a gift from your generous hand. The food we eat is grown in the world you sustain. The community that supports us is called into being by your saving activity. Everything we have is a gift from you. Why then do we complain as though the manna raining down from heaven for us even now is not enough? Why do we worry that your well of living water will someday run dry? It is surely our sin that causes us to live as though we do not trust your goodness. Forgive us, we pray. Teach us again to put all our trust in your promises that never fail. 
Remind us that we are always in your loving care. Fill us with grace so that our lives might show forth the fullness of your love for all people. Amen. Believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Since God has forgiven us in Christ, let us forgive one another. The peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Please stand in body or in spirit and share the sign of peace with those around you.
I'd like to invite the children up. If I know I have a couple little ones. If they'll come up, we'll see. All right. And I'm going to have to change my time with the young disciples a little bit. Come here. Come on, you guys. Come on. Can you guys come sit up here with me? Yeah. So I was going to talk about grace, but we're going to change a little because toddlers probably are going, huh? <laughs> All right. You want to sit down on the step? You can sit on the step. Whoa. All right. There we go. Good job. All right. So I'm going to talk about a response to grace. I'm going to have to hide my goodies. <laughs> um, so our response to grace, because grace is forgiveness and love and, all right, Miss Lila, can you sit down with me? There we go. And so I was going to talk about how we respond to people with grace. And our response is helping others. Sometimes when, so I watch these two at my house, and we're learning to share. And so that is one way that we respond to grace is we share, don't we? We share. And one thing I was thinking, and we help others. So she held up the fish banks. What is this? Is that a fish? Fish? You want to hold the fish? I should have brought two. Um, is my battery dead? Uh, it's got a red light. Okay. Um, so the fish bank, it, for you, you guys who don't know, it's an ecumenical. It's not just Presbyterian. It's ecumenical, and it helps people who are hungry. It helps people who have lost their homes. It helps people find justice in their lives. Yeah, I need this, baby girl. Um, so these are things that we do to respond to God's grace. We help others. We help our friends. And I have a prayer. First of all, I'm going to give them a little prize I have a hand, a sticky hand for you. You want one? Do you want one? Do you want one? You can take it and stick it on your pew. I'll give it to your mommy then, okay? Um, to remind us to lend a helping hand to others. All right? Mommy will open it. Don't put it in your mouth. <laughs> All right. So I need your help because I think they're going to have a little trouble with this prayer. When I say, I'll say just a few words. Please repeat after me. Dear God, thank you for loving us and caring for us. Thank you for giving us enough grace to share with others and help us to share that grace. Amen. Whoa. Whoa, we made a mess. All right, can you go back to your mommies? Can you go back to your mommies now? <laughs> mommies, come get them. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I'll see you afterwards, okay? Let us pray. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you have to say to us today. Amen. The first lesson today is from Psalm 107, verses 1 through 3 and 17 through 22. Listen to God's word to you. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord tell their story. Those he redeemed from the land of the foe, those he gathered from the lands from east and west, from north and south. Some became fools through their rebellious ways and suffered affliction because of their iniquities. 
They loathed all food and drew near the gates of death. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them from their distress. He sent out his word and healed them. He rescued them from the grave. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love and his wondrous deeds for mankind. Let them sacrifice thanks offerings and tell of his works with songs of joy. All right, thank you for having me here again today. Our second scripture comes from Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. Listen to the word of God. In the past, you were dead because you sinned and fought against God. You followed the ways of this world and obeyed the devil. He rules the world, and his spirit has power over everyone who doesn't obey God. Once we were also ruled by the selfish desires of our bodies and minds, we had made God angry, and we were going to be punished like everyone else. But God was merciful. We were dead because of our sins, but God loved us so much that he made us alive with Christ, and God's wonderful kindness is what saves you. God raised us from the death to life with Jesus Christ, and he has given us a place beside Christ in heaven. God did this so that in the future world, he could show how truly good and kind he is to us because of what Christ has done. You were, much, you were saved by faith in God who treats us much better than we deserve. This is God's gift to you and not anything you have done on your own. It isn't something you have earned, so there is nothing that you can brag about. God planned for us to do good things and to live as he has always wanted us to live. That's why God sent Christ to make us what we are. The word of the Lord. Amen. So first of all, I wanted to talk just a little bit about Lent. Because as you know, I'm an educator at heart, educator for life, even though I've retired from that. Um, so I want to begin with a little educational background about Lent. And you all probably, this is familiar to you, and that's okay. So we began our journey through Lent with Ash Wednesday, a day of mourning for our sin and the sin of all humanity before God. Lent is a time for us to change our lives and to grow our spiritual lives. Remember, dust we come and dust we shall return is what we hear on Ash Wednesday. And as a congregation, we focus on spiritual disciplines. And we do that through three pillars, fasting, almsgiving, and prayer. And so remember, Lent symbolizes the 40 days that Jesus fasted in the desert as the devil tempted him. Fasting for many years, or for many, means denying ourselves something of earthly pleasure or giving up something. For Catholics, it means no meat on Ash Wednesday or any Friday during Lent, thus all those wonderful fish fries that we get to enjoy. And it's a form of prayer. Fasting is a form of prayer. And then almsgiving is kind of what we talked about with the children. It means giving money, giving our time, giving food to help those that might be less fortunate than us. It just means helping others, a helping hand, as I told them. For me, Lent is less about giving up something and more about a commitment to practicing a spiritual discipline. In Lent, we reflect on Christ's ministry, on Christ's death, and on Christ's resurrection. We slow down, or we should slow down, take time, examine our internal spiritual lives and the way we live out our Christian faith in the world around us. But today on this fourth Sunday in Lent, we focus on, the focus is on Ephesians 2, verses 1 through 10, which talks about grace, generosity and good works. So let's talk about God's grace. That'll 
kind of be the bulk of what we're going to talk about today. In the reading from Ephesians, we hear that grace is a gift from God, and we do nothing at all to earn it or to deserve it. Grace is free. Grace is a gift from God that has been bestowed on all of us. We worship a gracious, loving, forgiving God. Grace seems so simple, yet in reality, I think it's rather a difficult concept. So I work as a part-time Presbyterian campus minister at U of L, very part-time for our Presbytery. I have several students that are lifelong Presbyterians, a Baptist who is trying to make sense of her um, Baptist upbringing, her faith, um, searching for answers to questions she has, and then a few that have never gone to church or been part of a faith community. Um, so they come with some pretty difficult questions. Um, and I think we all have some of these questions, even me who has grown up in the church. Um, so the last month or so in our discussions, we've talked about a loving God versus a wrathful God. Grace and forgiveness for everyone? And what about folks who have never had the chance to hear the gospel or learn about God's love and forgiveness? This one took me by surprise when I was asked that, that there are folks that have never heard about Jesus. So our weekly discussions are, to say the least, interesting, challenging, and I never claim to them to have answers. I have my own questions and thoughts about God's love and God's grace. So one day on Facebook, I saw a friend post something about a book um, that sounded interesting to me. So I picked it up and started reading it. The book is called, If Grace is True, Why God Will Save Every Person. So the authors, there's two authors in this, and they emphasize that God's grace is for everyone. God will save every person. Grace is more than being cleansed from our sins, more than a ticket to heaven, more than being granted eternal life. Grace is being free of every obstacle to intimacy with God. <clears throat> so I was blessed with good parents, a nurturing church families I was growing up, healthy children, education, and much, much more. So it was, I think, easy for me to have a relationship with God. People face difficulties that I do, ha I do not understand. I don't have a clue what they're going through. And salvation is being freed of every obstacle that keeps us from an intimate relationship with God. Folks suffering from addictions or abuse or neglect deserve grace, yet their circumstances might keep them from an, that intimate relationship with God. Maybe as a church, we are called to remove obstacles that might keep people from Jesus or from God. Obstacles of prejudice, ignorance, pride, fear, confusion. We, the church, are called to speak up and speak out against such obstacles. And I think you all do that through open table. That's an obstacle. Food, not having food, food insecurity is an obstacle that could keep people from having a relationship with God. So we, the church, may even cause barriers. People walk in our doors feeling condemnation rather than welcome. And I'm not saying that about this church. Maybe all churches take a look at this. Um, I believe all churches could do a better job welcoming all people. Again, grace is not an achievement. Grace is a work of God. Grace has nothing to do with us and everything to do with God. This is a difficult concept. So God's grace includes, is for murderers, thieves, abusers, those suffering with addictions, and even us. Yeah, all people, no exceptions. Thinking about grace and love, a Bible story comes to mind. The prodigal son, uh, maybe you know the story. The son takes his part of the inheritance, goes away, spends it all, and then eventually comes back. But I imagine the father checking the open front door often for his son's return. It is a father who leaves the light on waiting for his son to return. 
This story is about a parent who does not abandon his or her child, just like God never abandons any of God's children. So as a Presbyterian youth minister here at Beulah for the most of my life, but the, my career, we talked about all things. We talked about all of us being a child of God. So when we went to Montreat, there would be one day we would hear over and over, we are children of God. So we grew up hearing that, that we are all children of God. Well, if everyone is a child of God, doesn't that mean God's grace is for everyone? What we do know is that God, the God we serve and worship, is way bigger than our understanding of God. It's way bigger than our understanding of God's grace. Grace is unlimited. Grace is unconditional because God is a God of boundless love. So reading the book, I was reminded that the prophet Jeremiah made it clear that the salvation of every person was not God's desire, it was God's promise. In Jeremiah 31, it says, The time is coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and Judah. It won't be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. They broke that covenant with me, even though I was their husband, declares the Lord. Now this is a covenant that I will make with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my instructions within them and engrave them on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. They will no longer need to teach each other to say, know the Lord, because they will all know me. From the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their wrongdoing and never again remember their sins. And that's from Jeremiah. So in ways we do not fully understand and can't completely communicate, we are drawn to Jesus. And yet not to Jesus alone. It was the God of Jesus that attracted us. The God who loves people more than formulas. God who loves mercy more than judgment. A God who pardons more than punishes. The God who seeks the lost, heals the brokenhearted, accepts the outcast, is kind to the wicked and the ungrateful, is merciful and forgiving, loves the whole world like the prodigal son, the light is on, the door is open, the most defiant child to return home to God. Grace is that unmerited divine forgiveness that Christians believe. Grace is what makes becoming God's new creation possible. And once we have experienced grace, we should then extend it to others. Grace. We definitely need more grace in our lives. So where's the grace when someone cuts, cuts you off while you're driving? Where's the grace when we mess up? Where's the grace when we post something on Facebook that is, you know, against someone's thinking? Where is the grace? We need more grace and we all deserve more grace in our lives. Everyone deserves that. Next, Ephesians is teaching us about generosity. God modeled generosity and wants us to learn that model. God sacrificed his own son for our sins. God generously shared so we could, should share with others. God also generously shares God's gift of grace and love. Another spiritual discipline, almsgiving. We give our time, our material goods, money, um, however that we can help. And I see you all are doing a white thing. I forgot what it was called, but you're collecting things for the ministry that are much needed items for those who can't afford to buy them. Um, you all have open table. You feed people. You help people. You open your doors. Um, there's a lot of ways that we can be um, more giving. We smile and are polite to our servers because I know a lot of us probably do eat out. Um, we allow a driver to merge in our lane. We care for the earth. These are just a few of the things that we can and a lot of us do already. That list could go on. And last, good works. So keep in mind that grace is a free gift from God. 
so we do not have to do good works, our response to God's gift of grace and God's generosity is the good works that we do. So it's kind of the other way around. We receive the grace and we do the good works. We don't do the work, good works to receive the grace. The Ephesian passage says that God designed us, created us for good works. We are created in God's image and God is good and always doing good works in our life. God created us and calls us to go into the world to do these good things. Not because that saves us, because it is our response to God's grace and love. Ephesians say we are God's handiwork, created in Jesus Christ to do good, which God prepared in advance for us. Verse 10 provides a powerful reminder that each person is created with purpose and intentionality by God including our careers. We are called to use our skills and abilities to do good works in the workplace, which God has already prepared for us in advance. Those good works include love, kindness, compassion toward others, toward all people. And now that is not an easy task. I, I work at it every single day. I learned about God's boundless grace and love for all people through two places in particular, and one is I've mentioned the open table ministry here at Beulah. Um, just serving others helped me learn more about grace, forgiveness, loving folks that sometimes can be difficult to love. And as a campus minister at UofL for the past eight years, I experienced God in the students that I have served. And through that experience, God taught me that grace is for everyone. It wasn't necessarily through any particular scripture that helped me to understand God's grace and love. It was more out of experience of God that helps us learn about God and grace. And I did by experiencing God through the houseless folks that I made relationships here at Beulah. Um, they, they came here for food, for hope, for uh, acceptance, and yet they taught me so much more then I probably gave to them, taught me so much more about God's grace. So salvation does not rest in your good works. It rests in your faith in God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. It is all about God, nothing to do with us. We serve a God that is huge, that loves no matter what, and promises never to leave us. So I wanted to close with a summary. I saw this on uh, Facebook, and it comes from the Presbyterian Mission Agency, our headquarters. And it's a summary of what Presbyterians believe, and I can resonate with all of these. So the first one is studying the Bible prayerfully and together helps us figure out which things matter more than other things. So when you come together for Sunday school or Bible study, grace does happen. Grace happens. Grace invites a response. God's grace invites response. God gave us brains and expects us to use them. So we're a thinking um, denomination. We are beloved, gifted, capable, and safe already, right now. God calls us to be on the side of the ones who are having the hardest time. Nobody's perfect. There's more Holy Spirit in a bunch of us than any single of us. That's why we do this as a community. And God isn't finished. And God's love is not limited to our particular faith community. I found this very helpful and true as I was reading about God and God's grace. So let it be so for you and for me. Amen. And now our response to what you've heard is the affirmation of faith, and it's in the bulletin. It's taken from a brief statement of faith for the PCUSA. So please, as you are able, stand in body or in spirit and let us together affirm what we believe. We trust in God, whom Jesus called Abba, Father. In sovereign love, God created the world good and makes everyone equally in God's image, male and female. 
of every race and people to live as one community. Hearing their cry, God delivered the children of Israel from the house of bondage. Loving us still, God makes us heirs with Christ of the covenant. Like a mother, like a father who runs to welcome the prodigal home, God is faithful still. With believers in every time and place, we rejoice that nothing in life or in death can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Amen. <coughs> Let us pray. Eternal God, our story together is one of your unending faithfulness to us. Even as we are not always faithful to you, holy source of all that is good, you have shown us yourself in abundance and mercy, in grace and abiding care. Knowing of your unending providence, we may come to you with the concerns that weigh heavily on us. We pray to you for world affairs beyond our control, for the people of Ukraine, Israel, and Gaza. We pray for peace, knowing that you alone are the source of true shalom, peaceable kingdom. Where there are those in harm's way, we pray for protection. Where we ourselves harbor enmity and prejudice, we pray for awareness and grace that we may learn forgiveness Teach us how we may serve you more fully in ways we cannot imagine. We pray for needs closer to home for our own community. As we enter the season of Lent, we ask that you open our eyes to the needs on our very doorstep. May we see those whose names are known to you and offer compassion and goodwill. We pray for victims of violence and gun violence in particular. 
We offer our prayers for those who seek solutions to, to their problems. Let us not give up hope. Let us not abandon the work of healing the world. We remember that all healing comes from you. We pray as well for ourselves, our own material and spiritual needs, where our members suffer from illness and affliction. Grant your healing touch and bringing wholeness. For any in our midst who suffer from depression or addiction, give us understanding and compassion. For those who are lonely, may we be a place of friendship, a warm haven where love is shared. To that end, we pray for the church, universal, Presbyterian, and our own congregation. Enrich our lives with your grace that we might also remove obstacles that keep all people from finding God's grace. We make these and all our prayers in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom the power, and the glory forever. Amen. In Christ, God has showered us with grace upon grace. In gratitude, we now give back to God through our tithes and offerings. Please pray with me. Gracious God, from the overflowing of your love, we have been given abundance upon abundance. Receive, we pray, our offerings and bless them. May be blessed by their work as we see your reign among us through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. <coughs>
And I say amen. Let God use us anywhere, anytime. So, folks, go out into the world, sure of the goodness of God. Remember the promises that God has kept. Be mindful of the ways that God has provided. Keep your eyes on the cross of Jesus Christ and the new life that is offered to us all. And may the grace, mercy, and communion of our God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, bless you and those you love both this, this day and every day. Amen. Amen.